I want to take the opportunity now to introduce um, a colleague uh, now for several years, and uh, she will also participate on the panel, but I'll go ahead and give her introduction right now. Dr. Collette was raised in Colorado. She came to Utah in 1975 to go to Westminster College. She attended the University of Utah Medical School from 79 to 83 and completed her family medicine specialty training at the University of Utah. She joined the faculty, the Department of Family Medicine in 86 and developed a new family medicine residency in the 90s that is now based at St. Mark's Hospital. She has cared for patients here in Salt Lake City for over 30 years and continues to see patients in the clinic and hospital setting. Never having had enough education, 2016, she went back to Westminster College to complete her Master's of Public Health, which she did in May of 2018. She's on the National Pulsed Provider Order of Life Sustaining Treatment Committee and the co-chair of the Utah Pulse Registry Committee. She has done presentations on advanced care planning locally and nationally in order to help patients to prepare for their care in times of medical emergencies. The conversation about being mortal is challenging, but the key to understanding what is important to individuals so their wishes can be honored when they are unable to speak for themselves. Dr. Collette. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, as you said, we, I, have, I give talks on the, uh, how to start the conversation about being mortal um, and living wills and pulse. And I actually have a, a scheduled talk here October 12th at the West Jordan Public Library from 2 to 3. So if you know anyone who doesn't have an advanced directive, I um, do fr just free public lectures just to help people fill out uh, the living will since it only needs a witness. And I incorporate some pre-meds to uh, help them assign so that the pre-medical students actually know what a living will is in advanced directive, and they actually get one before they're done volunteering with me. Well, let's go on with my talk. So do we have anything in America that the Americans agree on? We have a very divided country, very hard things to figure out what we agree on, but there's one thing. 94% of Americans think it's important that you really should talk to your loved ones about their wishes regarding end-of-life care. So, hooray. It's bipartisan. However, only 27% have actually had this conversation. We think it's important, but we don't do it. So where would you want to die, or, or your family members? People have some feelings about this. 70% of, of, of Americans, they really would prefer dying at home, being in, or surrounded by their family, being in their own bed. This is, is important to them. However, 70% of Americans die in hospitals, nursing homes, some sort of care facilities. That's the reality. So it would be nice if we all, as at 18, came a rite of passage that we all get our living will, just like you know, at 16 we get our driver's license. You know, on that driver's license we have a little D for organ donor. That actually is an advanced directive to be an organ donor. But it's not designated who speaks for you in case of emergency. The advanced directive, or living will, is the only one that really designates that. Well, only about a third of US adults have actually filled out this, put it in writing, and, and this is according to a recent report in 2017. So I don't need to embarrass anyone here, but if you have an advanced directive, just think, OK, where is it? Do I have access to it at 2 AM in the morning? at 2 a.m. in the morning. That's when the emergency happens. Um, can you find it? If it's in a safe deposit box someplace or in your lawyer's office, that's not going to help. It should be scanned in with your physician's office. It should be scanned in in the hospital you most likely might end up. Um, however, all these hospitals in the state of Utah, we have different electronic records. So you, the hospital you end up in the ER may not be the hospital that actually has your record. So I keep mine in the glove compartment of my car. But, you know, uh, in addition to having it scanned in in a variety of different places. So I'd like to brag about La Crosse, Wisconsin, because somehow they do it right. 96% of the adult population have living wills. They treat it like a rite of passage. Um, now, they have, to have a little easier job. It's a small town, mostly white, only two hospital systems, and they make it kind of like a competition. So kudos to La Crosse. What about Salt Lake City? Can we do it? I think we can. All right, so the Conversation Project, they did a survey back in 2013, 
and said, yeah, you know, 80% uh, of the population, they say, if, if they were seriously ill, they'd actually really want to talk to their doctor. Okay, not only do they think, 94% think it's important to talk to their families about it, but 80% really want to talk to their doctor. But in 2013, in this survey, about 7% of doctors had had this conversation with, uh, or patients had only had it with, 7% uh, of patients had had it with their doctor. And the sad thing, only 25% of the physicians actually knew what the patient's wishes were, or even knew who they should call in case of emergency. So this is a big problem. So we say, okay, well, we, we, some people actually have an advanced directive. Jehovah Witnesses, they carry cards around, says, hey, I don't want blood. Um, you know, I took a little picture of my own um, driver's license. That's my little donor card. It has a little heart. If you look at your license, if you have a heart and it says donor on it, that's an advanced directive right on your license, kind of. Uh, but we don't really know. Sometimes people don't know what CPR really is. I mean, we, we watch TV, and like 77% of people survive on TV. It is a miracle intervention. CPR is amazing. But in reality, 49 don't even make it out of the CPR if they have a cardiac arrest and are not breathing. They're in the hospital, and they're 65 and older. And usually, people who are 65 and older have at least one medical condition, oh, because they're in the hospital. So in reality, if you're 65 and older, and your heart stops, and you cannot breathe, and you're, you're dead, actually, that 49% never actually come back to life. Like we doctors, if, if your heart stops, do you want us to restart it, is the way many doctors ask about CPR. Well, the other 34% died during that hospitalization. So we got now only 17% that live from the actual cardiac arrest in the hospital. Now, then another group dies, and there's 10% that kind of uh, live, but they're in nursing homes, and it's, it's not, they're not playing golf like they're on TV or out, you know, or being interviewed on TV shows. I mean, the TV really gives us a false image. So advanced directives are important. And it's not just one and done, and we can think and put it to rest. This is something that has to be revisited. So the five Ds of advanced directives, and I've actually added the six D down at the bottom, but it's you really should review it at least every decade, every 10 years. If someone that you have listed on your form dies, your husband dies, your wife dies, I mean, your mom, I mean, you're, you need to find another person to put as the, as the backup person to be your medical power of attorney. If you get divorced from that person, if they're listed, <laughs> you may not want your ex making decisions for you uh, in the hospital or even talking to the doctors. People get new diagnoses. And also, sometimes they actually have a decline in health. Um, those are important things. Now, the one thing people don't realize is if you move to a different state, say you live part-time in Utah, part-time in Arizona, Arizona has totally different things. I don't know if Arizona requires a notary. Here in Utah, we just require a simple witness. Any neighbor can witness your living will. They do not need to know what's on the living will. All right. So this advanced directive, known as the living will, it designates who is speaking for you. Who can the doctors legally talk to without violating HIPAA rules? Because there's all sorts of rules of what doctors can say to different people. It documents kind of the wishes. And if you don't know, you've got to have the conversation and make sure those two people listed know what you really want. It needs to be regularly updated, obviously, because things change, and then available. Now, if it's available and the doctors know, ideally, we should respect it. And sometimes we change. Yeah, it, we have some interesting change. So we have to really make sure that we do honor people's wishes. But if we don't know what their wishes are, the default is do everything. And that's when the 9 year that collapse on the golf course it gets resuscitated into the ICU, tubes coming out of things, and then they call the family and, and they said, Grandpa would have never wanted any of this. Well, how were they supposed to know? So uh, the, as far as the living will, what's the difference between that and the form I'm going to tell you about? Um, the directions for the future, that's saying what a living will is. This is sometime way off in the distance. This isn't actually currently now. The pulse form, the provider order of life-sustaining treatment, is actually a medical order that you fill out with your physician if you are that someone who might die within the next year. 
they are the ones that need a pulse form, and then the emergency medical people can follow that if they see it. And so I tell my patients right now, post it on your refrigerator because we don't have an electronic form in Utah yet. We are working on trying to get that available to the EMS statewide. But this is, this is very different form than the living the will. You have to have a living will to designate who your medical power of attorney is. The pulse form, provider order of life sustained treatment, does not designate that. So we do need to have it completed by a patient who's actually competent. If you already have, your mother has dementia, she can't make decisions, and she doesn't have a living will, you cannot fill one out now. It's too late. But you can fill out a pulse form with their legal medical power of attorney, and if you don't have a living will, we do have certain people that are, are the doctors do know to go to, their, their um, spouse, uh, their oldest child, things like that. So we do need to know who, who you are designated to make these medical decisions. So we have this wonderful form. It's four pages. It's been passed by the Utah State Legislature in 2009. It's available on the internet. I can give you resources for that. And the best part is that no notary is needed. We just do a simple witness. So this is kind of just the four-page form. It's actually in your booklet that you have. Um, and um, then the Pulse form, the Utah Pulse form, has who is your doctor, what are your medical conditions, what are your goals, what are your wishes, where are your lines in the sand, what are you willing to put up with and not. And then it has, do you want CPR if your heart is stopped and you're not breathing? Okay. This is a very different thing than if I'm in agony on the golf course and screaming, and I have a pulse form, that doesn't mean do not treat. It, you get that person because they're, they're alive. But if they haven't got a pulse and they're not breathing, that's when the emergency medical people, if they have this form available, can follow it. And then it can be signed by your medical power of attorney. It can only be signed by a, a licensed provider, physician, physician assistant, nurse practitioner, um, here in Utah for the state of Utah. However, I'm on a national committee, and we are working on a national pulse form for the entire United States. I do not know what decade we will actually get that passed, but it would be really nice to have one form for the entire United States available and also available statewide, so that the, if you're in Arizona, they can access the Utah form. But these things require financing and funding, but we're working on that. So the pulse form is for actually right now. This is not something in the future. This is someone who might die in the next year, who's seriously ill. They have a complicated medical condition, and they need to have this, their wishes discussed before the big emergency happens. Um, so we want to honor their wishes. Now, there are some really innovative states. Oregon was the first to get an electronic pulse form. Kudos to Oregon. New York was the next. Now, if you see there, like Idaho, come on, folks. Idaho has one. We're, where's, well, we're in the development stage. So we, we had one up in 2013. It was up and running. And then funding ran out. So we need to work on this. We can do this in Utah. So this is a nice little summary of the difference between pulse form and the advanced directive. It's, the pulse is for seriously ill. It's for currently right now. Healthcare providers are the ones in charge of doing this. This cannot be done in a public library, like I'm going to be doing here October 12th, uh, with just filling out advanced directives. It is the responsibility of the provider to discuss it, because they're the doctor. They're the ones that understand their illnesses. But the patient needs to understand their illness, and, and so does the family. Whereas the advanced directives, it's for all adults 18 and over. It's for future. It's their responsibility to make sure they have it, and they don't need a doctor to they don't even need a lawyer to fill it out here in the state of Utah. You can have a group little advanced directive uh, instead of Tupperware parties, uh, living will parties, and, and let everybody fill that out. Do it at Thanksgiving with the family. So um, overall, we have just kind of this, this is the continu con continuum of care. We're all healthy until we're not. We get a disease, a diabetes, hypertension. Chronic. Then we kind of have some advancing problems. And then we start falling, ending up in a wheel, being on oxygen. We have multiple things that happen to us that make us more frail. And then, of course, nobody gets out of this alive. We all are going to meet our maker. So these are our living uh, resources. Uh, Leaving-well.org 
ORG is now a Utah site. The uh, Utah High School Association is now taking it over. It's a wonderful site. I visited it. It's a, uh, been revamped, but it's very good. It has these forms on it. Prepare for Your Care is a national way to look at videos. They have videos in Spanish and English. How do you talk to your doctor? How do you talk to your family? Uh, the Conversation Project, amazing. They have great thing. How do you pick a healthcare proxy? And then, of course, Pulse.org has the state map. So, folks, let's get our head out of the sand, and let's get this done. Thank you. <laughs>